0 0.5 exponential and logarithmic functions. You've seen them in Algebra 2, you've seen them in Precal. Now you get to see them one last time in a review capacity. We'll also be looking at them in new ways later on in calculus. So if you recall, we've got exponential growth type functions. That means the base, in this case b is bigger than 1. And we learned about exponential decay, where the base was between 0 and 1. The bigger the base got for exponential growth, the steeper it gets, as we can see in the graph to the right. And the closer to 1, actually the closer to 0 that we get on exponential decay, the steeper exponential decay gets. Something to keep in mind. Example 1 says, sketch the graph of the function f of x equals 1 minus 2 to the x. Find its domain and range. As always, we have to know what the parent function looks like, or we are totally out of luck. And the parent function for any exponential growth looks something like this. I don't need the exact numbers for that. I do need to go through my four-step process to get my points and my graph, though. The way I teach this in Algebra 2 is I say, first identify your parent function. In this case, I would say my parent function was negative 2 to the x. And that's really negative 1 times 2 to the x. I include the negative 1 in my parent function because it's going to help me remember to flip this upside down. Step two, I make a table. I only really need two points to draw a good exponential growth function. So I choose the two points that are going to be easiest for me. I look back at my parent function and think, well, zero is easy to plug in. Two to the zero is one times negative one. Then I think of what else is easy to plug in, maybe one or two. I'll choose two just for fun. That way I get points that are further apart. 2 to the second is 4 times negative 1. And I've got my two points. A couple of things I haven't taken into consideration yet are the shift and the asymptote. On the parent function, the asymptote's right here at y equals 0. Because of the shift, it might be somewhere else. And in fact, on exponential growth and decay, the shift is always found, or the asymptote is always that constant that matches up with the y shift. So my step three is to come up with a couple of things here. Come up with my shift. There isn't an x shift because there's nothing replacing the x. If this were x minus three, for instance, I would say my x shift was three. If that was x plus two, I would say my x shift was minus two. But that doesn't happen, so my x shift is nothing. Zero. My y shift, on the other hand, is that number on the outside, the 1. So I have to add 1. And in step 3, I also identify any asymptotes, which there is one. Always matches up with the y shift on exponential growth and decay. I shift the whole graph up 1. That means my asymptote shifts up 1. In that little parent graph, I'll illustrate that. My asymptote is going to move. Next, I go back to step two and come up with my new points. It's the step where I'm applying the shift. All my x values need to go up by zero. In other words, they don't change. All my y values need to go up by one. So negative one becomes zero, negative four becomes negative three. I've got my two points. I've got my asymptote. I should be able to get a pretty good graph. Go ahead and pause the video, try to put all that together yourself, see if you get the same thing I get. Worth noting, the plus 1 did shift the whole graph up by 1. That minus in the front of 2 to the x did flip the whole graph upside down. These are the things I'd be looking for. That's it for this one. Next up, some reminders about the fact that exponential and logarithmic functions are inverse functions, meaning if you've got one, you can get the other by going through the right little process. 
If you remember for natural log, the base is E. So the way we would look at this, E to the zero power equals one, which is what's written here. Again, the base of natural log is E, E to the first power equals E. E to the negative one power equals one over E. That's an algebra one review skill. That minus one means put that on the bottom. Then e to the second equals e to the second. That property is kind of summarized here. Also make sure you remember some of your properties of logarithms that show up quite a bit. Maybe write those down, make sure you've got them memorized. Specifically, in this type of situation, if the bases match up, go up with x. If the bases match up, go up with x. And down here are just two more of those exact same examples where the bases match up. Table 0.5.3 has some more things that you should already know about exponential and logarithmic. First line shows you a conversion, which we've already looked at. Second line also shows a conversion. Again, b to the 1 equals b, which is what we see right here. Domain and range of logarithms are flipped because we're switching x and y. That's what an inverse is. We just saw on the last page that an exponential function has a horizontal asymptote. Because we're switching x and y, that forces the log to have a vertical asymptote. So lots of little details that we have to remember from logs and exponents. And that's not even the end of them. You should also remember from Algebra 2 and Precal, the product, quotient, power, and reciprocal properties. This one's not really as important. All this is really saying is, I'll rewrite that over here and kind of talk through it. Log base b of 1 over c equals something. This is really saying that b to the x equals 1 over c. Apologies, let me say that a different way. Log base b of 1 over c is really the same thing as log base b of c to the negative 1 using some algebra 1 skills. And now using the power property, I can bring that negative one down. Really not necessarily worth memorizing rule D. It's more of an application that you should be able to do anyway. But A, B, and C, you need to have those rules down and memorized. Down here you'll see a warning that we don't have formulas for splitting up addition or subtraction inside logs. It's a common mistake to try to split those up like they're doing right here. But pay attention to that does not equal sign. This is bad math. Don't do that. Example 2 says we're going to solve for x. And to do that, we're going to use some of our properties. If you don't remember the base on a log without a base, you should remember that it's a 10, just like natural log is e. We're going to figure out what x equals in each of these cases by converting to exponential. For example, 10 to the square root of 2 equals x. Done. We absolutely could get that as a decimal answer as well, but unless you're told to, you don't really have to. Part B is pretty straightforward too, using that inverse property, e to the fifth power equals x plus 1. This time we're not quite done yet. We haven't solved for x. Algebra 1 students will be able to tell you just subtract 1 from both sides, and they'd be right. Again, we could get this as a decimal using our calculator, but it doesn't tell us to round to a decimal, so I'm not going to. Part C is a little different. It's in exponential form, and we're solving for the x. We want to take log of both sides, but not just any log. We want to take the log that's going to get rid of that 5 to the x. 
So remembering our properties, we should use a log with the same base as the current exponent, in this case, 5. If you go back to those properties, you should remember that since these two bases match, all we're left with is x. That's, a, that's an application of the product or the power property. And we've got log base 5 of 7, which I haven't talked about how to get as a decimal yet, but that's coming up later in the lesson. You might remember how to do it. It's called the change of base formula. But for now, we're done with this. Go ahead and pause the video and read this problem over to get an understanding of what you're supposed to do. If you think you can plug in the numbers correctly yourself, go for it. It comes down to just solving for t in this case. Go ahead and take a look at it, then we'll talk about it together. I'm looking at my given information, which includes a formula for power that requires time. And I'm told that my power that I'm going to be using is 7 watts. That's what I need to operate this satellite. So I know my power is 7. All that's left is figuring out how long this satellite should be able to operate. Pro tip, T should not be a negative answer when you're done. First thing you might say is, I don't like that 75, so I'm going to get rid of it. Now, I'll be writing some decimals up here, but you should not be rounding it all in your calculator until the very final answer. See if you get the same numbers as me. At this point, you should be trying to figure out how to get that t out of the exponent. Just like the last example we saw, we're going to want to take a log of both sides. And the base we should use in our log always matches up with the base in our exponent. So we should be taking log base e on both sides. That has a special name. Pause the video, try the next step on your own. I put two steps up there. I took my natural log of both sides, and I used my property that says since these bases are the same, I'm just left with whatever the power is. One more step finishes it for us. You should be able to do something to get t by itself. Go ahead, pause the video, see if you get the same thing I do. I multiplied both sides by negative 125, and rounded to the nearest day. My time is a positive number, which makes sense. So I feel kind of happy about my results and move on with my life. Last example, I think. Maybe one more. We're going to solve for x. This looks like a mess. We did do some of this stuff in some of the harder problems in honors pre-cal. It is totally fair. Go ahead and think about this one for a second, see if you can come up with an idea. Maybe pause the video. If you thought, man, I sure do hate fractions, then you thought the same thing as me. My first step would be to multiply both sides by 2. Go ahead and pause the video and try to think of what your next step might be. If you thought, man, I sure do hate negative exponents, then you thought the same thing as me. Maybe pause the video, try to think of what you would try next. If you thought, man, I sure do wish I had a common denominator, then you thought the same thing as me. And that's kind of tricky. I'm going to multiply both sides by e to the x here. And we could have also just used fraction busters to get rid of the fractions as well. Either way is fine. We'd end up with something like e to the 2x, not e to the x squared, minus 1 over e to the x equals 2. Go ahead and pause and think about the next step. If you thought, man, the fractions are back, I want to get rid of them, then you thought the same thing as me. I would multiply both sides by e to the x. From here, it gets a lot harder. 
I say I say harder, but I really mean trickier. I remember from every time I've ever taught honors pre-cal, this is the type of problem that people mess up on. I get plenty of students who set this whole thing equal to zero. But what they don't realize that is how to handle this from here. You should be able to look at this and think that this looks like a very old, very familiar type of problem. I urge you to pause the video and try to think of what the next step might be on your own. The superstars in the group probably said, oh, that looks like quadratic form. This looks very similar to a squared minus 2a minus 1 equals 0, which I know how to solve. a minus 1, a minus 1 equals 0, a equals 1. Except I don't have a in this problem. I have e to the x. This is called quadratic form. And instead of a squared, I have e to the x squared. Side note, e to the 2x is the same thing as e to the x squared, using some algebra 1 rules. So this is quadratic form. And when I go through those same steps, I would get something like e to the x equals 1. At this point, good job if you caught me making a mistake. Go ahead and try to find it before I point it out and erase some stuff. I factored from here to here wrong. So I've got to get rid of some work that's wrong and fix it. I am only human, believe it or not. <clears throat> Turns out that this quadratic form is actually not factorable. Hopefully you all remember what we do when a quadratic function is not factorable when we're trying to solve for x. Quadratic formula. Go ahead and try your quadratic formula. I'm not going to go through the details here, but you'd end up with a equals 1 plus or minus the square root of 2. Applying that to my new function, that's really saying e to the x equals 1 plus or minus 2. We're not quite done. We've got to solve for x. I see that x is in my exponent, so I'm going to take log base e of both sides. And I'll get two possible answers. x equals natural log of 1 plus the square root of 2. There should be a square root of 2 there. Or x equals natural log of 1 minus the square root of 2. You might be wondering, why didn't I just write x equals natural log of 1 plus or minus square root of 2. There's actually a reason. Let's see if you can think of it yourself. Pause the video and figure it out. If you still haven't figured it out, we'll give you a hint. One of these answers is extraneous. Let's see if you can figure it out now. You're not allowed to have a negative number inside a logarithm. Logarithms are only defined for x bigger than 0. When I say x bigger than 0, I mean the inside has to be bigger than 0. So we've only got one answer. This one goes away. And we're done. Last up for this lesson is how to convert a log to any other base which really only has one application, figuring out a decimal approximation on a calculator. We want to figure out what log base 2 of 5 is. The formula we use is in our calculator. We can't type in log base 2 of 5, but we can type in natural log of 5 divided by natural log of 2. You can also type in your calculator log of 5 divided by log of 2. Those are the only two log buttons you have on your calculator. You don't have a log base 2 button, so you have to choose one of those. And then you'll be able to get your decimal approximation, and you'll be done. Go ahead and try that on your own. Check to see if you get the same answer as me. And that's it for 0 0.5, and that's it for Chapter 0. Hopefully you remember everything you've learned. If not, I recommend a remember-all.
Other than that, hopefully you'll have good luck on the test.